This is, as we know, the, toward, very close to the end of Lincoln's life. In, in March 1865, in his second inaugural address, Lincoln has delivered one of the greatest speeches in American history, Lincoln's second inaugural. It's, it's in the Janap book. Like the Gettysburg Address, it's incredibly brief. It's only 800 words. It takes about five or six minutes to deliver. Um, if it's remembered today, it's mostly for the final lines, you know, with malice toward none, charity for all, let us strive to bind up the nation's wounds, this call for national reconciliation. But before that, Lincoln takes the opportunity to talk about what the war is really about. Now, look, you know, this is March 1865. It's obvious that the North is winning, the war is almost over. It must have been very tempting to simply pat yourself on the back. We've won, look how great we are. A lesser man would get up and say, you know, mission accomplished, we have won the war. Uh, no, Lincoln doesn't do that. He starts out by saying, everybody knows what's happening on the battlefield, so I'm not gonna talk about that. We all know. What is this all about, he says? What is the cause of this war? Slavery. Sl everybody knows, he says, that slavery is somehow the cause of this war. Unlike the Gettysburg Address, he names it explicitly. <laughs> slavery is the cause of the Civil War. But that is not, that doesn't, he's not saying that to blame the South. Many people had said in the North slavery was the cause of the war, but they did that in order to stigmatize the South as responsible. Lincoln says, no, this is American slavery is the cause of the war. American. We are all complicitous. We are all guilty for this sin. This, is a, this speech is like a religious sermon. You know, Lincoln was not a deeply religious man. He never joined a church in his entire life. He... Um, uh, he, he, his religion, uh, in his early days, he was a, a religious skeptic, a follower of Thomas Paine, really. Uh, later on, he, became, he, he began to think about God intervening in the world in ways mankind could not quite fathom, but really there was no point in prayer or expecting miracles. You know, the, 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 God was very remote and Un unknowable. Basically, Lincoln's point is, we cannot know the will of God. That is a radical idea compared to today, when everybody in Congress knows the will of God. <laughs> no, they will tell you. They know God's position on the expansion of Medicaid. They know God's position on gun control. They all have a direct line. Not in 1860. Lincoln says, we don't know. We want the war to end, he says, but God's will may be different from our will. God may want the war to continue as a punishment to the nation for the evil of slavery. And, and he says in this convoluted, remarkable sentence, you know, if, if that's God's will, the war may have to continue until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk. All the property of the South may have to be destroyed. 250 unrequited toil. There, one more time, you see, is that stolen labor. The end of his life, he's back to stolen labor as what slavery is all about. Unrequited toil. And until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn by the sword. That is a very unusual thing for Lincoln. Lincoln almost never spoke about the physical visceral reality of violence and slavery. He spoke about slavery as an abstraction, a matter of principle, etc. But here it's the blood of the lash, the physical brutality of slavery. What is he saying? He talks about the terrible violence of the war, but he's reminding everyone, violence did not begin in 1861. There was 250 years of violence in America, on, in slavery, before the Civil War began. 
In an, this is almost like John Brown, now, not that Lincoln is channeling John Brown, that slavery created by violence, sustained by violence, can only die by violence. That, that's what Lincoln is telling. So that is the moral balance here, the terrible, terrible losses of the war and the 250 years of slavery. So what is the moral equation? Lincoln is asking people to think about the legacy of slavery. What is the legacy for this country of 250 years of stolen labor and violence? What is owed to these slaves? Lincoln doesn't put an answer out there, but it's a very remarkable speech in trying to force this issue into the consciousness of a triumphant North, you know, which doesn't want to hear about it. They want to celebrate and pat themselves on the back in fact, this speech is quite unpopular, and Lincoln is kind of disappointed. And he says uh, somewhere, he says, you know, well, I know people didn't like my speech much, but, you know, men do not, men, something to the effect, men do not like being reminded that their aims and God's aim may not be the same. So there's this kind of modesty he's calling for, which is not very in much evidence uh, at that point. Well. At the very end of his life, in April 1865, Lincoln probably realized that all of his reconstruction efforts had, were, had failed. And in, in, in his last public speech, April 11th, at the White House, 1865, he talks about reconstruction. His last public speech about reconstruction, he invites Charles Sumner to stand on the White House balcony with him while he's giving his speech. It's, his, it's a symbolic effort to draw the radicals to his, you know, to his side. Um, and he talks about Louisiana, and he says, you know, they have a constitution, um, they've abolished slavery, um, we, we need to get them into the Union. By the way, he says, they will, if we recognize that government, it'll be a vote for the 13th Amendment. We need three quarters of the states for the 13th Amendment. And he, then he says, you know, well, some people don't like this Constitution because it doesn't give black people the right to vote. Blacks want the right to vote, he says. A, a very amazing thing to say. I mean, you, know, you read Lincoln, there's always this wonderful... Who cares if black people want the right to vote? Before the Civil War, no president would have paid any attention to that in the slightest. But here's Lincoln's... That's part of the agenda now. That's part of the situation. They want the right to vote. That's part of the equation here that we have to think about. Um, I myself, he said, would prefer that the vote were now conferred on the very intelligent and those who serve our cause as soldiers. This is now saying publicly what he had said privately to Han the year before, right? First time any American president has publicly stated support for any kind of black suffrage. Now, it's not universal suffrage, it's not universal manhood suffrage, but Lincoln, by this point, is way, wherever he started out on race, he's now way ahead of the curve. At this moment, only five northern states allow any black men to vote. They can't vote in Pennsylvania. They can barely vote in New York. The property qualification is so high for them. They can't vote in Pennsylvania. They can't vote in Ohio. They can't vote in Illinois, where Lincoln is from. But nonetheless, Lincoln is now saying we need to at least give some African-American men the right to vote, especially these soldiers, as he had always felt. Well, of course, Lincoln didn't know this was his last speech, right? But it was. And some people say John Wilkes Booth was in the audience. And when he heard about this, he, the, the conspirators had planned to kidnap Lincoln and hold him as a sort of hostage. Booth supposedly, this is, you know, may or may not be true, supposedly people testify that Booth said, now we're going to have to kill him now. This means Negro equality. Forget about, we're going to, so as we all know, Lincoln took very little care. Today, wherever the president goes, he's surrounded by secret service men, he's got all sorts of security, we all know that. Lincoln was indifferent to his own protection. Um, his sort of friend and bodyguard, Ward, Ward Hill Lamon, wrote him a note a few months before this saying, tonight, as you have done on several previous occasions, you went unattended to the theater. When I say unattended, I mean you went alone with Charles Sumner and a foreign minister. 
neither of whom could defend himself against an assault from any able-bodied woman in this city. <laughs> so, um, so on that night, uh, let's see if we can find our uh, picture here of, uh, here we go. Here is the assassination of Lincoln in Ford's Theater um, on the evening of April 14th, 1865. There's John Wilkes Booth firing a shot at Lincoln. An actor killed Lincoln, but not just an actor. John Wilkes Booth was a very famous actor. He was almost the most famous actor. In the, this would be like, I don't know, saying Brad Pitt shot the president or somebody, not just some actor. You know, just think of the shock, or, or I don't know, Leonardo DiCaprio or somebody. Quite a shock. But anyway, Lincoln is shot. What day is April 14th, 1865? It is Good Friday. And the fact that he is shot on Good Friday, dies the next day, sort of encourages what would have happened anyway, this apotheosis of Lincoln as a kind of Christ-like figure who dies for the sins of his, of his country, the sins of mankind. Um, we will see soon what, who, the man who succeeds him, Andrew Johnson, the vice president, is certainly not up to Lincoln in any way, uh, deeply racist, no standing in the Republican Party, a very poor politician, by not at all the man who can handle Reconstruction, as we will see.